Uh, today we have uh, Yakub back. For those of you who have joined us yesterday, would know him as the person who brought the advice monster and asked us not to do it. <laughs> and then we have his co-host today, Jeremy. Today they're going to bring us uh, the session by the name Co-Create the Emotional Culture in Your Organization. It's a 90-minute workshop and it's going to be really, really great. Uh, just a quick uh, note that there is a discuss uh, box on the right-hand side where you can add your questions. Um, and we would, since it's a workshop, there will be breakout sessions, which I will uh, announce to you guys when um, J uh, Jacob and Jeremy are ready to do that. So over to you guys, uh, and the stage is yours. Uh, Jeremy, could you share your screen? And probably then I'll leave, leave the stage to you guys, just to make sure everything there is there. And your cool. camera as well. All right. Thanks, Thank Vincent. you, Vinci. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on, on where you are today. In this session, you will hear how we can co-create the emotional culture in your organizations. Um, my name is Jakub. I come from Poland originally, but for the last six years, I've been living in, in beautiful New Zealand. I'm an agile coach and an agile coaching trainer. And right now, uh, two emotions are dominating in me. I'm not sure if you can see it in the, in the camera, but I'm showing a card that, that says helpful. And I, I feel helpful hoping that this session can be helpful for you guys. So I hope that I can deliver some value to you, to you and you can use some of the learnings with your teams and with your, with your organizations. And I also feel uncomfortable right now. Um, firstly, because, you know, presenting is not something I do every day. So that's probably a bit uncomfortable, but also because um, I cannot see you. I don't see, I don't get the feedback of if you are actually liking what, what you are talking about. If, you know, I cannot see if you are nodding, if you are uh, looking around. So that's a bit uncomfortable as well. So this is me. That's how I feel right now. And I am not alone today, though. Hi, Jeremy. Hello, Jakob. Uh, hello, everybody out there in the in the internet world. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, could you say a few words about yourself? Yeah. So as Jakob said, my name is Jeremy. And I used to be a professional cricketer, actually, which I think is kind of interesting considering we're doing this in India. And uh, I went, I actually visited India in 2005 to play cricket in my former life. And now I run this business called Riders and Elephants, and I design card games for businesses. And one of those card games we're going to go through today. And uh, I'm obsessed with making really complicated things simple. I also suffer really badly from anxiety, and I'm feeling uh, super anxious and uncertain right now because of similar things to what Jakob said around not being able to see anybody's faces. But uh, I'm also feeling really optimistic and, and energized by uh, the opportunity to share this game and have conversations um, like the one we're going to have together today. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Jeremy. And uh, also, uh, we have Fincy with us in this session. She will help. She will be helping us with the technical side. Um, right. I think we should uh, move on to the next slide, Jeremy. Nice. Uh, and then this session will be full of activities, full of activities for you to play with play with the concepts we are talking about. And the first activity is going to start in a minute. We would like to invite you to reflect on, on this question. How have you felt in the last week? Have a think about what has happened in the last week and how have you felt in the last week? And to help you with this, we have a set of cards that can help you. So Jeremy, yep, cool, thank you. So here you can see black cards. And uh, on these black cards, you can see names of emotions, uh, like welcome, care, kind, fun, loving, and so on. So try to, again, reflect on the question, how have you felt in the last week? And pick one black card that best describes how you felt in the last week. If you have a post-it and a pen, that's awesome. Maybe use it to, to make a note. Uh, and choose one card and write it on a post-it. We will give you maybe a minute to do it. Yeah, 60 seconds. Quick, intuitive, yeah. feeling decision. 60 seconds, yeah. Try not to overthink it. Oh, 
I picked the card as well. Yeah, I've got mine as well. How much longer? Maybe 15 seconds longer? Yep, yep. Cool, all right. So these are the black cards. Uh, Jeremy, can you show the white cards? Right, so we have a different list of uh, emotions here. So the same question, um, but this time choose also one of the words from the black card, from the white card, sorry. So pick one one card that best describes how you felt in the last week. And again, choose the name of the emotion and write it on a post-it or, or a piece of paper. And again, 60 seconds. To, to pick one. Okay, I've got mine. Jeremy, do you have yours? I've got mine too, yeah. Cool. So, I'll go first, okay. Jacob. I'll share mine, eh? Yeah, go, go, yeah. Uh, just to give an example of what we've got. And so, if people can see these cards, hopefully, but I've got supported for my black card. And I'm feeling really supported because this week, we've actually had two or three conversations with the Agile India crew, Fincy and her team, helping us get ready to run this session. And that's helped me to feel uh, uber supported, super supported. On the flip side, I felt really anxious. I touched on that briefly before. I felt really anxious about how the session is going to go and how it's going to translate in the virtual world because, unfortunately, obviously, we can't be there in person. So this week, yeah, I felt really supported by the Agile India crew, but then also my own anxiety kicking in around uh, how we translate this current uh, session to, mm. the, to the digital world. What were your cool. two, Jakob? Yep, I got encouraged. Um, nice. I, I just joined a new company. And I joined two and a half weeks ago, and I must say that the onboarding experience has been really great, and I felt very encouraged by everyone, and I'm very happy that I, I changed the jobs. And I also, at the same time, I felt disconnected because, as I mentioned, I'm from Poland, and the the COVID situation in Poland is not the best. It's getting worse and worse, and I'm feeling disconnected from my friends and family back in Europe. Mm. Right, so I hope that you could see um, more or less what this activity is about, and we would like to invite you to do the same. Uh, in in few minutes, we will, uh, with Fancy's help, you will be joining breakout rooms. Uh, and in the breakout rooms, there will be five or six of you in the breakout room. Take uh, 60 seconds each to share a story about why you chose your two cards. So say what uh, what was on your black card and explain quickly and briefly what why you chose this card and then tell us um, or share what was on your white card and explain why you chose this this card. Okay, uh, Jeremy, did it make sense? Yeah, exactly right. Just a, sec a sixty second okay. story of why you found each of those cards. Yep. So you will have um, you will have five six people per breakout room. You will have maybe seven minutes all together for the whole group to share. So. Make sure you, you give space to everyone to, to share their emotions. Cool. All right. Um, so what, what you had had a chance to experience was uh, what we call weekly retro activity or we, weekly, weekly retro check-in. Um, this is an activity that you can do very easily with a team as an icebreaker or as a check-in exercise. So you can you can imagine yourself when, you, when you're running a, a a session with a team, it could be a retrospective, but it can be any other session as well. And you could just uh, ask the team, how, how are they feeling right now or how have they felt in the last week? And they choose uh, one of the black cards and one of the white, white cards, and then you can invite them to share their emotions and quick, brief, brief, brief description why they felt this or what is behind the card. Um, and that's a great, great way to bring people closer. And in a, in a few minutes, Jeremy will explain a bit more why this is so powerful. Um, this can also be done individually. So something that I do every Friday 
I have in my calendar uh, half past 3 p.m. I have weekly retro with myself. And I look at these cards and I one of the things I do is I try to identify how, how have I felt in this week. What are the dominant emotions? Uh, one, the, the positive ones and the negative ones. And I try to do a bit of reflection. Why did I feel this way? Well, how did I react when I was feeling this? And how can I feel the, the positive emotions more often? And how, what can I do about the negative emotions? Uh, could I have done something differently? And what, how I can improve next, next week? So you can easily run this, this with, with yourself or with your teams. Um, yeah, as an icebreaker or a check-in exercise or, or just a retrospective. Cool. Over to you, Jeremy. Nice. Yeah, thanks very much, Jacob. So uh, that was the icebreaker or the weekly retro exercise. And what I thought I'd quickly do is just take 60 seconds to uh, tell you about what we're going to go through today over the next sort of, what have we got, hour left, hour and a bit left. So yeah. it's going to be as interactive as we can make it. Uh, I'm all about helping people learn by doing. So there's going to be less theory. I don't like to uh, pile people uh, up with theor theoretical frameworks or approaches, um, but make it more practical and so we can practice these conversations. And we're going to teach you these four practical activities you can go away and use with your teams uh, straight away. So my hope and Jakob's hope is that you'll feel confident and brave to be able to walk away and use the tools immediately to have really powerful conversations within your teams and yeah, as we said, have a pen and paper or a post-it note ready because uh, you don't, unfortunately, have the physical cards. So um, we're going to take you through how to do it uh, with remote teams because you can run these activities like we're doing now with remote teams. You don't have to be face-to-face, -face, which is, I think, uh, part of the really cool thing that we can continue to do this with remote teams. But before we get into the next three activities, I thought I'd just take maybe five to ten minutes to give you a bit of a – or tell you a bit of a story about – why emotion matters in the workplace and where this game uh, where this game has come from and what it's all about because there's probably over 100,000 people around the world having these conversations in their workplaces now which is really heartwarming for me because uh, there's still a lot of there's still a lot of uh, stigma around these types of conversations but I thought I'd go back to where this all began and about 5 years ago I was working for a brand agency so brand design and strategy and uh, we were charging clients a lot of money for projects, but uh, I also felt we were overcomplicating things a lot. And that frustrated me and made me really cynical of our work. And I was struggling to even articulate to our clients uh, some of the concepts we were working through. And I'd come across some really amazing card games for businesses. And one of them was called The Brand Deck. If anybody's uh, seen The Brand Deck, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't, go and look it up because it's a really amazing tool. And the brand deck, there was 100 terms, and you used the game to decide what your brand attributes were. And I loved the interactivity of it. I loved how it simplified a complex conversation. And at the time, I was working with customer experiences, and I started designing a game called the Customer Experience Deck. And the Customer Experience Deck had 100 feelings in it, so similar to the feelings you've just seen on that, on that sheet on the screen there. And what we did is you'd go through the cards, and you'd pull out the things you wanted your customers to feel and the things you don't want your customers to feel. Because my theory was that if we can figure out what we want our customers to feel, then we can have a conversation about how we can make them feel more of the pleasant and how we can help them avoid the unpleasant. And I designed that game and I took it to a friend who worked in HR and she was the head of people and culture for a big uh, multinational company here based in New Zealand. And she said, that's great, but I don't have customers. My customers are my people. And I thought that was a really amazing moment. I thought, wow, why don't we change this game? And instead of asking, what do you want your customers to feel? Why don't we make the game, how do we want our people to feel? And then if we can decide as a leadership team or as a coach how we want our people to feel and not feel, then I think it makes for a really easy discussion to go, uh, how are we then going to help our people feel those pleasant things and avoid or manage with unpleasant things? And that was the start of this uh, the emotional culture deck game. But on the flight on the way home from Auckland, where I was meeting um, uh, Brooke, I read an HBR article, which is called Manage Your Emotional Culture. And it was by two amazing professors in the US called Mandy O'Neill and Sigal Basad. And it turns out they've been studying for 25 years why emotion matters and how emotion works in the workplace. And in that article, there was one really amazing line that just sort of hit me. Uh, 
and uh, made me uh, made that sort of the hairs on the back of my neck stand up because it just unlocked everything. And and that line was that most organisations don't care how their people are or should be feeling at work. And that really resonated with me because in my working career, we'd focus so much on uh, values, purpose, mission, and behaviours, but we hadn't focused on the emotional aspect of organisations and what their studies over over 20 years have shown is that um, how significant the impact emotions have on people, uh, how they how people perform tasks, how engaged and creative they are, and how committed they are to their organisations, and also how they make decisions. And that really struck me because I think intuitively I'd understood that, but I didn't realise that there had been so much research into the space. Uh, but the reality is most companies tend to focus on shared values or behaviours and that set the overall tone for how employees think and behave at work. And I'm sure we've all been in teams where we've had conversations around team values and team behaviours, but very rarely do we talk about uh, team emotions or individual emotions in the workplace. And their research also said that it's important that we talk about values and behaviours, but the other critical part to how people think and behave is the emotional culture, so how people feel at work. And Mandy O'Neill and Sigal Basad coined this term emotional culture, and um, and um, emotional culture influences employee satisfaction, motivation, connection, engagement, burnout, teamwork, even hard measures such as financial performance and absenteeism. So all of these things that uh, are, we can measure are influenced by how people feel in the workplace, which really blew my mind. Positive emotions are consistently associated with better performance, quality, and customer service. And negative emotions like group anger, sadness, fear, and the like usually lead to negative outcomes, including poor performance and high turnover. And maybe that might not be rocket science or it might not be re uh, relevatory to you, but uh, there's a lot of people in the world who, who, who dismiss the notion of emotion in the workplace or emotion in life, uh, not realizing the impact that they have that we can measure and has been measured for 20 years. And what Sigal Basada and Mandy O'Neill said was that when leaders ignore or fail to understand emotion, they're glossing over a vital component of what makes organizations tick and their companies and people suffer. But when leaders, really inspired leaders, recognize emotions in the workplace and shape them, they can better connect and motivate with their employees. And I've paraphrased, that's, that's paraphrasing a lot of their research, and I would wanted to share that with you word for word so you could, um, you could really feel... Uh, what they were talking about. But if my question to, that I ask myself constantly, so I've been using this game for six years. I've used it with thousands and thousands of people and had conversations about emotions in the workplace with thousands of people. And I still ask myself this question. So if emotions are so critical to our work, why don't we talk about them at work? And uh, I think I've uncovered a few reasons why over the last six years or five years. And the first one is that I've noticed that people want to talk about their emotions at work. They just don't know how to do it. And that's a really important thing because I, a lot of leaders come to me and say, oh, our people won't talk about them or they don't want to talk about them or they're afraid to. But I've realized that people do. They don't know how. And it's because we don't have the labels. We don't have the labels to talk about our emotions at work or at home. And when we don't have the language, we can't talk about them. And um, why that matters is that this game, which you guys can download for, uh, for free and start using with your teams, uh, this game gives us the labels. and. Uh, what happens when you have the physical cards is there's a really amazing thing called um, transference and I can transfer my feeling or my, my emotion onto this onto this card and it makes it far easier to talk about. And I think we had a question there, Jakob, from somebody uh, who was there, it was from Sandeep asking, uh, it takes courage to share one's emotions. How do we encourage people to do that? And the really important thing I've come to realize over the last five years is that we have to give people the labels and it's the smallest thing, but it has the most disproportionate disproportionate impact and when we give people the labels it unlocks their ability to talk about this and this is where this game came from and in this in this game uh, in this game we encourage people to uh, leaders to answer the question how do we want our people to feel but then I also realized that we should actually go to our people and ask them how they would like to feel and not feel at work because my hope is that as a leader if I know what Yucca wants to feel and not feel then I feel as if it's my job to help him feel more of the pleasant and help him manage and cope when he feels the undesired or unpleasant ones, and vice versa as well. But the other thing I've, I've come to realize, and one of my biggest insights over the last five years, is that, uh, is that we catch each other's emotions like the common cold. 
And this no, uh, this concept is called emotional contagion. And uh, maybe if, if you've heard of emotional contagion before, uh, hit the thumbs up button and I'll get a feel for, for how widely known this is. But I stumbled across this research also from Mandy O'Neill and Seagal Basad. And why having these conversations about emotion in the workplace is important is that if you're a leader and you're, and you're displaying uh, certain emotions and your people are, are more likely to, to catch those emotions. And unfortunately, as leaders or as coaches, because we're on display more often and people are looking at us more often, we're even more contagious. And so managing one's own emotion and being more self-aware about our own emotional drivers, the pleasant and unpleasant, is really important to how our team performs. But also vice versa, because as a leader, we'll catch the emotions of our people, of our teams. And this is why this conversation is really crucial, because we can, uh, and you will, have, you will have come across leaders who say, we have these values and we have these behaviors, and why aren't we living up to them? And we'll have constant conversations about that. But often the thing that's overlooked, as I said, is how we feel, our emotion, and those things will have the biggest impact on our team's performance without us even really knowing it. And so after about five years or so, uh, uh, we've now, yeah, uh, we've now using this game with all these people around the world. But the most important thing is it's unlocking really important conversations in teams. And and Yaku has been a big part of this journey, and he's been using it with teams around New Zealand and the world as well. And we're going to take you through three more exercises that you can do with your teams to help create more connected, empathetic, uh, and high performing teams uh, by using uh, a game like this to have conversations. And I think the final thing, Yaku, before we move to the next activity, is that. You might notice I'm really purposeful about talking about it as a game. And, I, and I'm deliberate about that because a lot of people are hesitant or they are unsure about this. And by calling it a game, it lowers people's aversions to it or reduces people's barriers a little bit because uh, I don't suggest we've got this uh, scientific uh, method and approach that's been studied by thousands of people over 25 years. And this is, and this is the, uh, the framework because that can overwhelm people. I just say we've got this game and, I, and we use it in a game like manner. Yeah. Funnily enough, I might share this story quickly, Yaka, but uh, in a workshop I ran a couple of years ago, I had, a, I had a fellow in the room with his hands behind his back and his feet on the table, and he looked at the game and it says the emotional culture deck. And he said, I don't have any feelings, mate. All I feel is contempt and apathy for the world. And, uh, and I then... I then quickly said, well, you do feel things, right? You feel contempt and apathy. And he goes, oh, yeah. And so you will come across people who don't, who think that this isn't important. But uh, by leaning into the game and, and nudging people to play with this game, you'll find it opens up uh, so much connection and, and meaning. So what we're going to do is we're going to take you through, as I said, three more little activities. And we want you to try these at home where you, or wherever you are right now in the world and and get a feel for how they work because I'm hoping you'll be able to then take them away and use them with your own team straight away uh, and change how you might connect with, with your teams. And so the next activity we're going to take you through is called the intention setting activity. And so it's sort of the inverse of the weekly retro. So in the weekly retro activity, you thought about what happened last week and you'd pick one black card and one white card for how you felt last week. In this version of the activity, we're going to think about the upcoming week. So what's happening this week? So between, let's say, between Wednesday and next Wednesday for us. And what we're going to get you to do is think about your next week, so the next seven days, and just wherever you are right now, have a look at the screen and pick one to three black cards that best describe how you want to feel in the next week. And then just take a pen and a paper uh, and write down the three cards you've chosen. Uh, if you've got a post, -it, if you've got a, a book of um, post-it notes, write them down on a post-it note. Uh, I like to write one per post-it note. Uh, the reason why it works really well if you write it on a post-it note, just as a little tip here, means that you can hold it up to the camera like it is a card, even though it's not a card. Obviously, it's a post-it note. Yeah. But yeah, we're going to give you two minutes. Gut feel, intuition, two minutes to pick one to three black cards that best describe how you want to feel in the next week and then write them down on a bit of paper. And once you've done that, put them in the chat box. So come back to the public chat box and just write down the three things that you want to feel in the, next, in the upcoming week. And we'll give you two minutes from now.
Cool. So people are coming in. So curious, like how did and play for? I love that. Curious. Right. Confident. We're curious as confident, optimistic. Uh, great question, Rajesh. No, you can't choose them all, unfortunately. Uh, the challenge is to only pick one to three, uh, and quite specifically and purposely, because if, of course, you're going to want to feel them all because they're all uh, pleasant, or you might think of them all as pleasant, but we need to have some sort of critical focus so we can check back in on ourselves potentially at the end of the week. Uh, or if you're doing this, uh, if you're doing this with one of your teammates, uh, you can check back in and, and find out how they went. Uh, so yeah, one to three. And and this is this is very similar to what we do with teams, right? So with teams, we have we want the team to be f- uh, focused on on a on a user story or or the specific work they are doing or on a improvement actions. We don't want them to start everything at the same time. So that's why we work with product owners to have priority and to tell people what the focus should be, what the goal should be. So this is similar. If you choose everything, you're it's like you are choosing nothing. So it's good to choose something so that you can focus on this and then reflect on this. Nice. Yeah, there's some really interesting uh, – this is really cool. Thanks for sharing these. Keep sharing them if you're doing this because um, Curious has come up a lot, and it's it's really fascinating. You can imagine if you're doing this as a team and you then start to notice that people are picking the same cards so there's alignment, or if people are picking different cards, why they might be all picking different ones. Um, yeah. That in itself is interesting. Okay, so we'll give you 30 more seconds just to, if there's anybody else still to put their, um, pick their top one to three. Kind and proud, I love that. Mm. Okay, nice. And so what we'll do, so that's part A. So you've just labeled uh, the top three things you want to feel for this upcoming week. And now you might sort of get the drift here. Now we're gonna now we're gonna pick the unpleasant cards. So think about the same week, this upcoming week, and pick one to three white cards that best describe how you don't want to feel this week, but you might from time to time. And that's a really important uh, caveat to this question here. So the one to three white cards that you don't want to feel this week, but you know you will experience in the upcoming week. And so for me in this upcoming week, it's going to be really insecure. Uh, I don't want to feel insecure, but I know I'm going to be because I'm running a really big session with 80 people in the next week. So your job now, I'm going to uh, two minutes. Up, we'll give you two minutes. Oh, I think we lost the, the slide, Jeremy. It's coming back now. Oh, it's back. It's back. Cool. We're going to give you two minutes to pick one to three white cards for what you don't want to feel this week, but you might from time to time. And write them on a piece of paper again, uh, or and then put them in the chat box. All right, we started getting something. We have nice. blocked, just alone, just reactive, blocked, alone, insecure, and stuck, controlled, restless, stuck. Nice, thank you. Yeah, brilliant. And and a, and a really simple follow up question: If you're doing this in a one to one, or with if you're doing it as a team, is what might uh, what might cause you to feel those things? And we've, there's, mm. uh, we're going to take you through some of those questions um, a bit later on, but. The really important part here is labeling these. Um, as you go through this, I'll share the story around the labeling. And uh, for a long time, people ask me, why should we go through the white cards? Why should we have a really uncomfortable conversation or a difficult conversation? Because sometimes it's easier not to have this conversation or some leaders are worried about what it might bring up within teams or what it might trigger. And for a long time, I actually didn't really have a, a Definitely not a scientific reason, but not a not a, a rational reason for why we should do it. I only just knew because I've done it for four years how powerful it was doing it and watching people label them and how transformative it had been. But then really recently I, I started reading a book by Mark Brackett, Dr. Mark Brackett, and he's the head of 
he started the emotion, uh, the Center for Emotions at Yale, and uh, and he um, he talks about what happens in our brain when we when we label unpleasant emotions and. When we're labeling these unpleasant things, it actually moves from our amygdala, that part of the brain, to our prefrontal cortex. And so by labeling unpleasant feelings or unpleasant emotions, we actually reduce the unpleasantness of them. Mm. Quite simply, that is the most powerful reason why we should be going through these white cards in our teams because our teams do and we do face unpleasant things on a daily basis, yet labeling them as uh, as um, Dr. Siegel said, you have to name it to tame it, but labeling them reduces the unpleasantness of them, and especially when you're doing it as a team. I think that's very powerful. Um, my answer, and not knowing the research, my answer uh, to this question would be, well, yes, there is a risk if we start talking about this, but what is the risk if we don't talk about this? Mm. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, at least now we we know what's happening. We make it transparent. Yeah, we it's start a great uncovering question. some of the deeper issues. Yeah, it's a really it's a really great question. And then as a team, or yeah. you individually out there, have just come up with your top three. You've just labelled those things that you know you might be experiencing this week, and so now you can move or nudge yourself into a growth mindset or a, a, a proactive mindset and think about the things you might be able to do to manage and cope when you when you do feel those things this week because you've just you've just uh, been able to label the fact that you might experience them from time to time. Mm. So that's the, that's the intention setting activity. Uh, those two activities we've taken you through in that first half of the, in the first half of our session here, the weekly retro and the intention setting activity are the two simplest ways to nudge our teams to talk about emotions in the workplace in a really non-intrusive, um, fun, interactive way that they won't be expecting. Uh, that really really gives you insight into where people are right now in their in their lives outside of work, in their lives inside of work, and also helps you understand what they might be facing uh, upcoming uh, in the upcoming um, time frame. So, yeah, the simplicity of those two conversations is really going to start to start to open up and connect your teams in a way that they might not have done before in regular um, kickoff sessions or uh, weekly meetings or how whatever the frequency of the meetings are you work you work in yeah so Jakob you are going to talk us through some of the ways that you've been unleashing emotions in the in your agile coaching practice using um yeah using these tools yes uh, I've been using the game for maybe two years now Jeremy I think I met you in October uh 2018 I think so it's been two years in and I use it in many many companies with teams with leaders and um, I want to share with you some of the examples of how I use it with specific example of specific teams and what problems we're trying to solve using this game. Uh, on this picture, you can see a team at their New Zealand. This is the, one of their sustainability teams. And, and this, was, this was an existing team. It was very, very well um, established team. They, they, they were working well together and they had a clear purpose. But at the same time, they never had a chance to establish what was important to them. Um, and we ran this exercise in, in two, two different sessions. In, in the first session, something really amazing happened. So we did uh, ask the similar questions to, to the questions that you went through. And in the first session, they shared their individual emotions, how they wanted to feel and how they didn't want to feel at work. And at the end of the session, you could feel that, that there was this unique atmosphere of excitement, compassion, and, and unity, something that rarely happens at, at work. And I don't know, somehow because we are in this together, we are sharing our deep uh, emotions, what was happening in our hearts, we kind of connected on, on a different level. And um, at the end of the session, one of the, the team members, she said, I feel these warm butterflies in my belly. And then she asked everyone if she could give them a hug. And basically we, we ended up hugging each other. Even I was being hugged, even though I was not part of the team. Uh, you know, this, this overwhelming emotion um, was flowing in, in this room. Uh, and in the second session, um, this team agreed on what was important to them as a whole team. So in the first session, they were talking about what was important to them as individuals. In the second um, session, they, they went to the level of, of a team, the whole team. 
and they decided what specific behaviors they wanted to introduce to emphasize the positive emotions. And they also decided what behaviors they wanted to stop so that they can stop feeling their negative emotions. And again, that was very powerful. One of their actions, because they wanted to be optimistic as a whole team, one of the actions was that they wanted to start sharing some positive sustainability news that they could hear from other companies. And that was one of their actions on a Monday when they were coming to their stand-up. They would share, someone would share what is happening in the world that is optimistic about um, sustainability, about ecology, about saving the climate, and so on. So that was amazing. I was coming to the stand-up and they were sharing all of these, these positive stories. Um, next team, um, next team was, um, it was a digital agency who was um, always busy to do, to do, or always too busy to do any reflection. You know how it is from project to project, from client to client. And you can see there was maybe a dozen of them. Uh, and you can see them playing with the cards um, on the table. And um, I run a retrospective exercise with them to create a space for, for reflection. Um, and they fully embrace it. They could uh, finally, for the first time, they could feel, they could hear how, how much under pressure their CEO felt. They got to feel what the sales team has, why the sales team hasn't been able to, um, to deliver what they were supposed to deliver. Uh, they could celebrate how much they enjoy the feeling of community and, and of togetherness. And at the end, they came up with specific actions based on the emotions they shared. Again, very, very powerful. It took us, I think, about two hours to go through this exercise. Um, and, you know, these were, most of these people were software developers. So normally, or usually we think about software developers as people very uh, introverted. People who, you know, you would never talk about emotions with, with this kind of people. But that's very untrue. This is our bias and our... Um, uh, our conviction about um, about developers, this is what, you know, what we think. It's often not true. Uh, so, so give people a chance so that they can actually open up and give them also a space to reflect because that's what introverts need. They need this moment of silence. They can, they can reflect and they can tune in to their inner selves, tune in with their hearts and, and actually have a bit of reflection and, and then they can share what's happening. Another team, this is a team that was brand new. They were just, we are doing a, a bit of team chartering, a team liftoff activity. And you may know um, the team canvas that many te teams use. And we are using team canvas as well as, as a kind of basis for, for setting, uh, setting up the team. And in the team canvas, there's a section to create uh, common values. What is important for us? What values are we going to live by in the team? And this team, they, they use uh, the emotional culture deck, the game, to help during the, the team liftoff to, to come up with the values, to establish the, the common values. And we use the emotions um, that they chose to be our guide to understand what was important to them. It allowed, it allowed us to share what was going on in our hearts and share our past experiences as well, and to draw the vision of the future of the team. How do you want to feel in this team? And we started talking, how are we going to call out if we start feeling these negative emotions? What are some of the coping mechanisms that we need to put in place? And how we can encourage the positive emotions? So from this, it's helped us create the values for us. It also helped us create the working agreement, specific behaviors that we, we valued, and specific behaviors we didn't want to see. So these are three different activities that you can use with already established teams, also with teams who don't, who feel that they don't have time for reflection. Um, you can use it with, with, with software teams, you can use it with business teams, and you can use it with, for team liftoffs, just like here. And another way to use it, I think that should be on another slide, yes. So that's a, a way how to, after running an exercise like this with a team, uh, from time to time, you may want to check in with the team and then see how they're doing, how they are feeling. So this is an, an, an example that, again, I use with one of the teams. 
on the left you can you can see the names of um, six positive emotions that they chose for themselves, how they wanted to feel as a team. It was inspired, supported, welcome, involved, appreciated, and open-minded. And what we did is that I asked them to rate, to look back at the last um, two weeks, or maybe it was a month, it doesn't matter, to look back at, at a couple of weeks and rate uh, how often did they feel inspired, supported, welcome, involved, appreciated, and open-minded. And one was I'd never felt it, and five was I was constantly feeling it. And they rate themselves. Every person came to this board, they got the dots, they were rating how often they were feeling these emotions. And after this, we were started We started to talk about, um, you know, why didn't we really feel any of these emotions too often? And what patterns they could see? And what, what, were, we, what were we going to do about this? How can we be more supportive to each other? How can we feel, how can we feel more inspired? How can we appreciate each other more? We, having, we had all of these conversations so that we could start building the emotional culture we want to have. So I hope that, that this, this some examples could give you some inspiration, what you could be doing with your teams, simply with this game. Um, and I've been using, as, as Jeremy mentioned, you can use it in, with remote teams as well. So that's also possible. Well, it's question time. Yeah, let's just do maybe... Uh, I suddenly realize we're running out of time, but let's maybe just take a couple yeah. questions and see what's come up. And the first question is, how different is it when compared with Mood Marble? Jakob, I don't know what Mood Marble is, so if you know what it is, you'll be able to answer that question, mate. Well, I think I do know. Well, what comes to my mind is that you could use, um, in a team room, you could have a kind of a jar maybe when people can put a, I don't know, blue marble when they are feeling good okay. and positive yeah. and Red marble when they are feeling bad. Okay. I'm not yeah. sure if that's, that's what this means here. Okay. If that is a, uh, that's a really cool game. And I like the, I like the notion of it. But the one really important thing when talking about feelings or emotion in the workplace is getting as granular as possible without naming them. And if it's just good, bad, or not so good, or green, orange, and red, then we don't really allow ourselves to, uh, to regulate or to interrogate or to label them in a way that. Um, we can use them. And so by giving people labels, by helping people uh, find the label, it really helps us understand what's going on at a deeper, mm -hmm. not so superficial level. Another question, yeah. will this work in a team where there's low level of trust? Uh, really good question, Rajesh. And it's really important that we use this game with teams and low levels of trust. And there's a really beautiful book called You Are Not Listening by Kate Murphy. And I've just finished reading it. And in that book, she has she mentions this line that vulnerability precedes trust and that really stopped me in my tracks as well and i thought that is um that's a really beautiful way of talking about trust because if, if vulnerability precedes trust nudging our people to label how they feel so anxious alone or free and supported that's nudging our people to be vulnerable which is the step before trust and so um giving people these labels and nudging them to be vulnerable is a really important step on the on the on the ladder to reaching or to creating trust, um, and because it's a game as well, it's um, easy for people. The name of the book is called uh, "You Are Not Listening" by Kate Murphy. I'll just write that in there. Uh, Another way to approach low trust environment is uh, in, invite people just to share the name of the emotion. They don't have to share the whole story behind it. Sometimes even just sharing the card with the name of the emotion is enough for people to be involved in this and, and help them open up a bit. Even if not now, maybe maybe a bit later, but it's going to be the start of the journey to open up and to start building the trust. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Okay. And um, that builds on the question here from uh, Rajesh saying, will people be honest when they uh, – I think with, will, will people um, be honest in sharing how they really feel? And there's two really important parts to that. And this will be the last question before we move on. But there's two really great questions. There's two parts to that. Uh, one, we always nudge and encourage the leader to go first. And I'm a huge believer in reciprocity. Uh, it's the opposite of Simon Sinek's leaders eat last. But in this, in this situation, going first encourages reciprocity, reciprocity from our teams. And when I go first and talk about why I'm feeling anxious or why I don't want to feel anxious and the reasons, then I'm being vulnerable and we're asking our people to be vulnerable in return. And so it's really important the leader goes first. 
the part B of this is that this game, or talking about emotions and this game, is not a silver bullet. It's not going to automatically fix or solve or open up everything. But the more we have these conversations, the more vulnerability we show, the more we connect, and slowly the more we trust each other to then be even more open and honest. But the most important thing is starting. And by giving people the labels and starting the conversations over time, we become even more open and become even more honest. So leaders going first is really important. And then nudging people through more moments of conversation to um, talk about this is important. Yeah. So, yeah, really good, great questions. Um, I think we'll move on for now, Jakob, and then we'll, we're going to have, yep. we'll have some more time for questions as yep. well. Yeah. Uh, so the third exercise we're going to take you through is actually the original exercise or one of the original exercises in our game. And why this is really important is that we're going to, and you are going to now actually, uh, answer this question, how do I want to feel at work? So the first two activities we did were team-based activities that you could do on a weekly, fortnightly, or monthly basis. But now we're going to look inwards and uh, explore explore some self-awareness and why I think this is really important, especially from a coaching perspective or a management or leadership perspective, is that we have to manage our own emotions before we can manage our teams. Uh, I don't know who said that quote, but I love that quote and I'm unashamedly uh, stealing it, but sharing it with you. And, and this is part of that. And so this question, think about this question, how do I want to feel at work? And what we're going to get you to do here is, uh, is go through the cards again, and we're only going to give you two minutes uh, to do this. Go through the cards again and individually pick three black cards that you need to feel to be successful. So this is in your work overall, holistically in your work overall. Pick three black cards that you need to feel to be successful. And the question in the actual physical game that we answer is, my success relies on me feeling this. And so my number one thing, I'll just give the example now, Jakob, is free. The number one thing I need to feel in my work to be successful is free. When I'm feeling free, I'm the most successful uh, that I can be. So we're going to give you two minutes to go through all the black cards again and pick out your three black cards that you need to feel to be successful. And then you can write them down on a piece of paper so you have the you have a copy of it. But then once you've written them, uh, written them down, also add them in the chat box as well so we can get a feel for you all going through it. And somebody's already done that that quickly, which is really cool. Uh, so we'll give you, yeah, about a minute and a half now. So do work a appreciated joy and humble. It's really beautiful. Appreciated. Free, joy and ease. Arathi, you've got free as well. That same as me. We're on the same page. We both need to feel free at work to be successful. Brave, confident, proud. I love that. Hopefully, as you're going through this exercise, you're having a few light bulb moments as well. Humble, connected, energized. Appreciate, supported, wonderful. And as you're going through this, imagine if you were doing this with your own teams, with your own people, and finding out from them how do they want to feel in, uh, feel in their work. Um, you might not, you might be surprised or might not be surprised. This question doesn't get asked at work a lot. Uh, yeah, I think it's one of the most meaningful ways to connect with our people and also uh, help them feel engaged. Optimistic, supported, at ease from Art Thresh. Cheating, inspired, connected, appreciated, wonderful. Oh, wow. This is amazing. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, a few more. We'll give you 30 more seconds just to, um, for those who are just picking their final, their final one or two. Humble, kind, inspired. Okay, brilliant. So we're going to move to part B, which you probably will have been getting, continue to get the feel of, but now we're going to talk about the unpleasant cards, so the white cards. So uh, 
This is individually picked three white cards you don't want to feel at work, but you might from time to time. So just quickly, where this differs from the intention setting or the intention setting one is that this is more holistically. So when we do the intention setting, we're setting a time frame. So it might be a week or two weeks. And we're really specific about using that in that moment in time. But now you're just going to pick overall or holistically speaking, the top three cards that you don't want to feel in your work, but you might from time to time. And so my number one thing I don't want to feel in my work, but I do a lot, not just from time to time, but a lot is anxious. And my second one is alone. And I do feel that from time to time, uh, which is kind of ironic because I do work for myself uh, and we only have a small team. But those are the two things I don't want to feel in my work, but I do from time to time. And so now you're going to do the same thing and we'll give you a couple of minutes now to, to write down and then put in the chat box the three feelings, emotions that you don't want to feel at work, but you might from time to time. Jakob, what are your three, your top three things that you don't want to feel in your work, but you might from time to time? I don't want to feel confused. Mm -hmm. um, when I hear different messages, especially from leaders, I'm very easily getting confused. I don't want to feel... Um, uh, insecure or oh, no? There is a different one. Um, what is on the card here? Oh, oh defensive is another one. I mm -hmm. don't want to feel defensive. Um, I know I can easily get defensive when someone has a different opinion or when someone gives me feedback, and I'm working on on getting to be less defensive. So mm -hmm. this game it allowed me to understand that I don't want to feel this, and it mm -hmm. helped me understand that I often do feel this. And mm. now I have this kind of trigger moment in my mind. As soon as I get defensive, I'm much more aware of that I'm getting defensive and I can choose. Do I do something about this? Mm -hmm. Or do I keep going being defensive? Yeah. And sometimes I can now successfully allow myself not to be defensive, which is amazing. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes I get, you know, very deeply defensive. But um, more and more often, I, I'm, I'm feeling that I can win, win with this. So, yeah. Nice. Another story I had that was in one of the workshops, and there's a story I like to share, is that one person in the workshop, they, um, he shared that sometimes at work, he doesn't want to feel, but from, sometimes, from, but from time to time he might, is powerless. And he shared the story how at home he, he had a teenager, and this teenager um, was making him feel powerless. And he was bringing this emotion with him to work. And at work, he was also feeling powerless. So this emotion from one place was being transferred to another place. And after sharing this, um, I could see how the team changed in the next couple of weeks where they offered him much more support. Mm -hmm. They also much more, um, that there was more kindness and more compassion in this team. And they were uh, helping him to to feel more supported, which is very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, that's extremely powerful, and yeah. such a small thing as well to be able to name that, name that, and share exactly. it with your leader, and vice versa. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so everybody's. It seems like lots of people of anyway have come up with their top three and put them in there. So, um, if you have written them yeah, down, you. Yeah, hopefully you've written them. Hopefully you've written them down as well, so you keep that list. But you'll be able to come back to this and um, and do it again. And um, what I wanted to quickly show you all is uh, my top five. So we for this exercise got you all to pick three. Uh, generally speaking, when I play this game with people, I get people to pick five. But some people only want to pick three, and that's fine. Or they might want to pick seven, and that's fine too. I generally say don't pick more than seven, though, because. Um, because of that conversation at the start, if you have so many, you become overwhelmed as well and we can't focus on any of them. But these are my top five things that I want to feel in my work. I need to feel in my work to be successful. So free, inspired, brave, thoughtful, and rebellious. You might have, you might have started together by now uh, feeling rebellious is, is, or the rebelliousness, the rebelliousness in me is because I feel as if I'm fighting a whole industry here who focuses solely on purpose, vision, and values, cognitive culture, but completely neglects the bit that governs how humans behave, which is emotions. And so I need to feel really rebellious in my, pers in my work personally because we're fighting against the, the status quo in a sense. So those are my top five. And 
Uh, I've only I'm only sharing here quickly my top five for the things I want to feel. So the black cards. But imagine if all your teams had a list of this as well. And if Yaka, my hope is that if you knew my top five, which you do, which you do obviously, and you were my manager or leader or coach, that on a daily basis, weekly, monthly basis, you'd help me feel more of those things and find out mm. what triggered me to feel those things, and and vice versa. When you know that I don't want to feel anxious and alone, or well, that story of that person feeling powerless, how you might help me yeah. to overcome. That. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. So that's the, that's the self-awareness piece, and, and that's really important, I think, at an individual level, not only as a coach and understanding our own emotions as a leader, but also then finding out from our team what drives them, what makes them tick. In a way, that's not just a, a personality questionnaire or a Myers-Briggs thing where it tells you who you are and what you're about. It's, I'm a big believer in autonomy and giving people choice and control, and we're able as individuals to go through this game and pick the things that are most important to us and what drives us. So it's a really, really powerful but simple exercise. Uh, I want to quickly show you uh, just what I've done with the team recently. So I work with a lot of cricket teams, being an ex-cricketer and still knowing the game. And this is a women's cricket team here in Wellington. And we went through, we've gone through this for three years with the team, but this is uh, last seasons. And every player has come up with a list of their top five things they want to feel and not feel in their cricket season. And this includes the coaches, the playing staff, and the support staff. And so they've all gone through this, but then they've also done it as a team and come up with the top five for their team. And so as a team, they want to feel, or their success relies on the team feeling supported, proud, thoughtful, fun-loving, and inspired. And the team, the team environment, the culture of the team, they don't want to feel doubt, alone, and uncomfortable. And so you can imagine how powerful this is, uh, within a sports team when the coaches understand the emotional drivers of their players and they can then use that to have ongoing conversations, coaching conversations, not just the technical skills, which anybody can learn technical skills, but these, um, these emotional intelligence and EQ skills and understanding these things um, is really important for high performance athletes and high performing, high performing teams in the corporate world as well. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So question time. Let's take um we've got fifteen minutes left, which is probably enough time actually to take a couple minutes of questions, you reckon, Jakob? Yeah, there's actually one question from Dolly. How would uh, it help to share these with peers? Do you think it would make the same impact as sharing with coaches and managers? Nice. What's your experience with that, Jakob? Yeah, I think that's totally. That's one of the examples I was just sharing about the powerless emotion that one person shared. Then it was the team. Uh, gathered around this person and provided the support. I think that's very powerful. Uh, if if you can understand how your peers want to feel and don't want to feel, you can change how you behave. You can start better understanding your interactions and you can better understand what you can offer to another person and what to expect from another person. And you can just build your own empathy for, for the people around you. Yeah, I, th I think it's incredibly powerful. I don't, I'm, I'm really fresh off running a whole bunch of stuff with cricket teams, the men's and women's teams, but seeing them sit around in a group and share their individual uh, emotional drivers was so powerful. Um, not only just understanding the label, so not wanting to feel anxious or alone or, and wanting to feel supported, but then the stories that come behind that. And the really important story is is not just picking, not only picking up, but then asking uh, why you want to feel that way and what would cause you to feel that way. So those things become really powerful ways to understand each other and connect with each other rather than just purely saying, uh, I want to feel, I don't want to feel anxious or don't, or do want to feel supported. Yeah, Rajesh, I think it's more powerful when we share with peers. I think exactly right. Yeah, exactly right. So maybe let's do one more question, Jakob. How do you, uh, this is from Vinaya. How do you, help people open up to share something so personal. Safety and trust are big factors to enable this. Uh, yeah, really good question. And it's one that for me, anyway, Jakob comes up a lot and it might for you as well. Screen there is, um, is how do you um, help people to open up? And what's really important, uh, in the virtual world, it's slightly different. So I didn't design the game for the virtual world. This has always been for the first four years of its existence, being a physical card game. Uh, we've had to turn it into a virtual card game because of COVID, which, was, which has been a great pivot. Uh, but what you find if you do have the physical cards is that that gives people the courage 
And there's that transference. I, I mentioned it briefly before, uh, this notion of transference, where you transfer what you're feeling onto the card, which gives you permission. So there's naturally permission in this game. It's built into this game by accident. And there's a thing called a three-point conversation, which is really powerful in that if Jakob and I are talking together in a coaching conversation or just any conversation, it's, that's a two-point conversation, Jakob being one point, myself being the other. But as soon as I bring a card into this, especially one that has an emotion on it, that's the third point, and it becomes really easy to project onto that and then open up and share something that I wouldn't normally share if I didn't have this third point or the card to be able to do that. So don't underestimate how powerful having the, having physical physical artifacts to transfer um, what we're talking about onto to enable the safety and the trust piece, yeah. Well, I think there's one one more question where I think is a long, long question, but uh, the, the answer should be relatively quick. The question is from Rob about using it with non-native speakers. And do we have a version for uh, with on with different languages, or do you think that um, non-native speakers would maybe be frustrated or anxious when using this? Yeah, awesome question. So uh, we've we've got it translated at the moment into a couple of different languages. We're only just starting on the translation journey, but we've got it in Italian, Spanish, and German, and we're working on French. And we've done that to answer that very question because natives, uh, people who have English as a second language potentially, sometimes struggle to find the nuance and the meaning. However, I wouldn't underestimate if you have no option just starting with the English version and nudging it. And and sometimes that can actually reduce people's uh, reduce people's fear of it and increase the engagement in it because there's another aspect of problem solving within the game. So it actually creates a really nice little um, byproduct conversation, which then as allows us as like a Trojan horse to have this conversation. Um, so we are translating into different languages. Uh, however, because we don't have it in every language in the world, there's still some difficulties with that. And I know we've, uh, we've sold this game into 42 countries around the world and not all of those are English speaking countries. So I do know that non English native speaking people mm. are using the game to with really great success and talking about how they feel um, in English, even though it's not their first language. But yeah, great question, Rob, um, and one we're constantly working on. Uh, cool. So, Let's move on, shall we? Yeah. So last um, last one, and I think potentially maybe even my favourite conversation. It might be one of your favourite ones as well, Jakob. Mm. Is a conversation around emotion led change, how we help our teams navigate uh, change through the lens of emotions at work. And and at the heart of this conversation is this notion that change is not a decision of the mind, but of the heart. And that's really important because normal change conversations or transformation conversations at work or in, your, in teams are based mainly on the functional aspect of change, the structural element of change, not the emotional aspect of change. And, and emotion, uh, change is such an emotional thing. And so this game works really well to have those conversations um, as leaders and with our teams. And the question we can ask ourselves is what do we want our people to feel through this change or transformation? So many of you at the moment will be going through uh, going through a change or some sort of transformation in your team or uh, a transformation project. And, and we often bring teams of agile coaches or scrum masters together to have this conversation. And you can also bring functional teams together, and you ask the question, our success relies on our people feeling this. And so I thought, let's give this a go for the last for the last activity, which you can then take away and use yourselves and experiment and play with. But the question is, think about a transformation you're leading at the moment. If you're not leading one at the moment, think, think about one you've gone through. Uh, sorry, there's a typo there. Uh, apologies about that. That should say, or have gone through. And then answer this question, how do you want your people to feel? So I pick the top three cards and then write them in the chat box. So think about the transformation you're leading at the moment or one you've been through and then pick three black cards that best describe how you want your people to feel. And the question we're essentially asking there is our success relies on our people feeling this through the change. So we'll give you uh, two minutes, I think. So we've got nine minutes left. So we'll give you two minutes to do this. Pick your top three, then put them in the chat box and and have a conversation. And then we can have a conversation um, about those. 
And I think that's a very powerful question. Um, and it doesn't, it's the most powerful when you are starting a transformation, but you can do it also when you are in the middle of it. Uh, it can help you reflect how, how you're doing and how you're approaching the transformation. And it can also give you some insight if the transformation is not going well or not according to your plan. It can give you an insight why it's not, not going according to your plan. Uh, I feel that when we talk about change, we talk about change management and how we drive change. Drive change, it sounds for me like driving a car, like driving a machine, driving a resource, right? And we, we forget that there is a human emotional side of change that we should take into account. So asking how do we want people to feel during this change, um, I think that, that, that can bring the uh, humanity into the whole change process. And we can stop thinking about driving a change, but more how we can take people on the journey with us so that they can feel positively about this change. No, some of these, some, some are coming through now. People are writing down their top three. Uh, if you're doing this in a workshop with a group of leaders, you could do top three to five. You could do five if you wanted. Uh, we're just doing three for this particular exercise. But the beauty of this game and these conversations are you can you can hack them and change them and edit them based on your team situation or how much time you've got as well. Uh, so you can get quite creative with how you have these conversations once you have the construct. Mm. Somebody asked, uh, I wish there was empowered. So in the actual game, there's blank cards. So down the bottom, there's some blank cards. So you can actually add in blank cards. So you could add and powder in there if you liked. I wish we had way more time, Jakob, uh, to keep going. Yeah. There were some really great questions, but we, um, what I we're going to do. What was that? Sorry, go on. You go. Uh, I was going to say what we might do is I'll, I'll go to the next part. And because um, we've only got six yeah. minutes left, I imagine they're probably not. We're probably not allowed to break the rules. The rebelliousness and uh, my wanting to feel rebellious doesn't really uh, extend over to breaking the conference rule. <laughs> but the question you would then, and you can ask yourselves, and I encourage you to all to go away and maybe play this for, with yourselves and finish this exercise. But is what don't we want our people to feel through this change or transformation? That's an equally important question to ask yourself. So there might be a bunch of things we don't want them to feel. We don't want them to feel alone or uncaring or overwhelmed. And if that's the case, well, how do we manage, how do we help our people manage and cope when they are feeling that through the transformation or the change? Normally we focus on what we want people to do. Like Jakob says, we focus on driving the car and driving action rather than, rather than exploring the emotional drivers, the things that govern how we behave. And so uh, this is, um, I think, hopefully going to be a really powerful discussion that you can start having with, yeah. with, other, with other coaches or with other leaders inside your teams. Um, because we don't have much time to do this, we won't actually get everybody to, uh, to do this part of the exercise. But as I said, uh, you're going to be able to download these um, slides and, and use these cards yourself so you can come back to this yourself um, when you get to it. Uh, but um, – do you want to touch on a couple of more of these? Um... Yep, yep, I can quickly go through them. Mm -hmm. um, this one is, is an example of, of a, a emotion-led culture change that we had, uh, again, at, at Air New Zealand. And um, this was, we had 60 people in one room, and we, want them, we wanted these people to tell us how, how they want to feel in the company. Uh, so we were talking about, we asked them to identify the emotions they want to feel. And at the end of the workshop, they identified six emotions they wanted to feel. Um, and again, great energy. And, and from there, we started looking at different experiments that teams wanted to, to start doing so that we can start feeling these emotions more often. And on the next slide, it's, it's a more personal note. This is an exercise I did with my wife. Uh, and we, we sit together and we, we did the, we asked questions, you know, what, our, the success of our relationship depends on uh, on me feeling supported, equal, connected, and so on. And we also talk about how we don't want to feel in our relationship. And we created this, and it's it's actually still uh, on next to our door. And we we go back to this from time to time, and and it's an awesome way to build empathy and uh, and and build better relationships. So that's another way how we can use it. Yeah, I love that. I love it so much. We, I didn't design this game to be used with uh, 
uh, for relationships or for schools or for families. Um, but yeah, it's so powerful uh, the conversation having it, it not is. in the workplace. But yeah, having it having it at home even helps us in the workplace because we're developing yeah. these skills. Um, we're developing these skills that we can bring into our teams on a daily basis as well. Mm. Yeah. Yep. So uh, last couple of things. Uh, I think this question might have come up earlier on, but it's like, how do we bring all this together? And this is an example of a of a, an agile or a, a community of practice, a, a big bank here in, across Australia and New Zealand, and we ran it with all of their scrum, scrum, master, scrum masters and a few of the agile coaches. And so we got them together as a team, and they decided as a community of practice that they wanted their people to feel supported, encouraged, involved, appreciated, and confident. And they didn't want their people to feel overwhelmed, disheartened, intimidated, uncomfortable, and, and anxious. And then we've designed this canvas to then have the so what conversation. So it's all well and good labeling these and discussing them and coming to consensus. But then we've got a bunch of questions. We then work together as a team. You can do this individually or as a team to start exploring what these mean. So the questions are, we know our people are feeling supported if we see or hear. And their answer was attend meetings together. And we know people are feeling involved if we see, if we hear positive comments and mirroring and we know people are feeling appreciated if they're being thanked and acknowledged by each other. And then the second question is people will not feel supported if we. I really love exploring undesired behaviors. So we started with the emotion. We know we want people to feel supported, but they won't feel it if we do certain things. And then to help people feel these things, what do we need to do? And so we haven't just started with behaviors. We started at emotional drivers and blockers, and then we have a discussion about behaviors. And I think that's a really powerful reframing of team, of, of, how we, um, of how we lead our teams rather than the general approach of values, behaviors, and they're not even talking about emotion at all. Uh, I wish we had more time to go through this. Uh, you, can, I know. you can get access to this canvas um, as well, but uh, it's a really simple way to bring the team together to then have the so what conversation. Uh, so... Uh, last two things, uh, Jakob, you've just touched on it there with you using it with your with your wife, which was so cool. But uh, we've discovered recently that families are using the game more and more, which warms my heart. And actually, that's the most uh, helps makes me feel super proud, but also really humbled by this because um, this young girl, I heard a story. Um, I got an email from a man, uh, a fellow who's using the game, and he plays the game with his daughter when she gets home from school. And instead of asking, "How did your day go?" or did you have a good day at school? They go through the game and, and, and um, she picks out how she felt at school that day. And it's just such a rich conversation. And families are doing it together to find out what they want their family environment to feel, much the way you are doing it, Jakob, with your partner. Um, and young kids, the age of seven or eight. And I think if we can have these conversations earlier on in our lives and our family environment, it's going to then transfer to the workplace and help um, help our teams. But these things aren't taught at school. And so by providing a game for people to talk about something that we don't normally want to talk about, that we don't normally open up and share, it's, it's going to have lasting impacts into, um, into, into other areas of life and society. People have asked if we can, if you can download the game and you can download this. So uh, if you go to that URL there, ecdeck.com forward slash agile India, you can download the workshop plan, you can download the cards, and you'll get a whole bunch of other tips and tricks on how to use it as well. Uh, Jakob, I wish we had way, more, way, way longer to, to share stories and run more exercises. I know, I know. Um, but I believe we can go to the um, to one of the rooms after the session. I'm gonna, I can uh, hang out for uh, 15, 20 minutes and ask some questions, and we can go a bit deeper if someone wants to join us. Yeah, nice. And I will also upload, that's a good question, can you get the slides? Um, I think they're going to record, Agile India recording, I think, um, Fancy, you guys are recording. So we'll that. Uh, yeah, this is being recorded. The session is being recorded. It will be uploaded into YouTube as well. Uh, you guys will receive an email when it gets uploaded as well. But um, the um, deck and uh, the deck and the resources, uh, Jeremy and Jakob, if you would want to share with it the team, if you could send it as an sure. email, we can get in touch with you for that and we can add it as handouts here. Uh, and we can get it uploaded in Confingen as well against your proposal. Um, so we can do, yeah. Nice. Awesome, yeah, thank you. I think that's us. Yeah. I think that's us. We run already over time. 
thank you everyone for your um, attention, for your uh, engagement, for going to the chat. Thank you for all the thumbs up because I can see now it's already over a thousand thumbs up, Jeremy. I think we did wow. a pretty, pretty good job. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you guys are receiving a lot of thumbs up. Um, and it's going up. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to say a thumbs up for the wonderful work that you guys did. I mean, I, uh, personally, I felt a lot more connected to you guys about, through the session and I'm sure, uh, uh all our uh, attendees also felt the same.